الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قول سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ونعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I said it before and I will continually say it regarding Surah Al-Kahf. This is our third session and inshallah we'll be covering within, it, within the time limit the ayah number 6, 7 and 8. And I said it before that Surah Al-Kahf is the foundational surah in the Quran for understanding the modern age. Because Surah Al-Kahf itself highlights the concepts, not the semantics or the technicalities or the finer details or the nitty gritties, but the concepts with which other things can be explained. In epistemology, this is essentially the way a person would learn, whether they are consciously aware of their learning or they are unconscious, they're just doing it naturally. Once you understand a concept, then everything else that pertains to that concept can easily be understandable. That concept is the knowledge. It is what you have embedded yourself with in your mind. When you have perceived something, you then have a concept of that thing. You conceptualize it. The concepts that Surah Al-Kaf highlights are embedded within the first uh, eight ayahs. <coughs> And in the previous session, we looked at the first five ayahs and we highlighted the major players on the board, on the earth. Who the players are, what are the geopolitical dynamics between these players. But now, what are the, the pieces, what are the, what, what are the cogs in the machine is what now the next three ayahs will highlight. Ayah number six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاغِيُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِن لَمْ يُؤْمِنُ بِهَادَ الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَ In the previous ayah, he had said, وَيُنْذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذُ اللَّهُ وَلَدَ The Quran has come as a warning to those who say that Allah has taken unto himself a son. This was the second group of people who are being highlighted, the Christians, and not predominantly only the Christians, but much of Western civilization because this is part of Western culture, of European culture, the father-son duality. The Romans, the Greeks, the Celts, the Nords, the Vikings, the, all these European uh, peoples, they all had this sense of a duality, a father-son relationship of, of, of deity. They have no knowledge of this, nor do their fathers, nor do their ancestors, nor do th does their lineage. So just by, by them saying, oh, this is culturally embedded into us, does not mean it is true. Going back all their uh, thousands of years, generations. Grave is the word that comes out from their tongues, from their mouths. It is a very weighty thing to associate anything or anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly or indirectly. This concept is the concept of shirk. And shirk has got the, the implicit modes of shirk and then the, the, the indirect forms of shirk. Man's duration of existence, man's existence is governed by how much time has been allocated for him. And when he allocates that time or exchanges that time for anything other than God himself, who has given him that time, then that in itself becomes an act of shirk. So the preoccupation of man in this world, when he gives himself, and when I say himself, really yourself, your thoughts, your emotions, your preoccupations to anything other than God himself or for the purpose of God himself or for the sake of God himself, it becomes a mode of shirk. It may not be shirkul kabira. 
it is it would be a shirk saghira a, a minor shirk but it is shirk nonetheless in lam yaquluna illa kadiba they do not speak anything but lies anything that comes out from these people with regards to the existential purpose of man when they try to tell you that this is what you are supposed to do this is what you're supposed to be this is your guide forward this is your sense of cultivation whether they say it implicitly or indirectly or in some convoluted sort of uh, sort of way disguised behind words it is nothing but lies because then logical deduction would say that if they are saying the lies then only the book of allah can give you the truth so what is the truth the truth is what the messenger was sent to give and by extension whoever hears that truth also bears the responsibility to impart that truth now generally speaking we always try to give the truth to others when we see something that the person himself cannot see the impeding threat that that person is going to encounter because when you're in a problem you can't see the problem somebody outside will be able to say and say and see and and say listen there's something wrong here you need to change your ways you need to change your lifestyle you need to do something different you're going in the wrong direction you think that you're in the right direction but you're going in the wrong direction the impartation of that truth is that the person who is giving has recognized something that the other person has not and for him to hear and accept that truth he has to humble himself if he does not have that humility if he is arrogant he will not gain the truth this was iblis's stance he was arrogant when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him ma mana'aka what prevented you he made some sort of logical syllogism to explain his way away but then the truth came out about him he was arrogant and that arrogance prevented him from seeing the truth there was nothing else that brought about the devil's downfall but his arrogance so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is then telling the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that it's not easy to convince others it is not easy to bring them over but you cannot keep banging your head over them falallaka baghiun nafsaka are you then going to destroy yourself ala atharihim over their footsteps in lam yu'minu bi hadha al hadith asafa if they do not believe in what you're saying are you going to destroy yourself with grief atharihim athara means the traces when 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 they would when somebody would uh, you would speak to them and then they just basically turn around and walk away so what you're left with now is their footsteps right so athara also means um uh, th- their influence or the impact the aftermath the consequence that they're walking away from you no matter how much you would tell them that the world is now changing there is something grave that is taking place but they will not heed what you're saying you've seen something that they have not seen but they will not see it deliberately and that change uh, 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 that that under uh, that, that lack of sight is driven by what it is that's clouding them what it is that they are hung up over what it is that they are tied with this is also a form of uh consolation that to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam directly the message of truth that he was giving to to the to his people and they would not listen to him the consolation is you cannot grieve yourself you cannot destroy yourself emotionally and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a very sensitive person sensitive not in the sense that he was emotionally crippled but sensitive in that he felt he felt the rejections he felt the sadness that he's because his concern was not just his immediate his concern was all of mankind because he was a messenger sent to all of mankind his concern was that people would fall into deception his biggest concern after when he migrated to medina and the revelation about concerning about the dajjal came to him and he was now speaking more and more frequently about it his biggest concern was that i fear for my ummah the greatest deception to befall them and that is the deception of the jal 
So this was also a consolation to them. I have some of my own students who, who, who get frustrated. How do, I, how, how do I tell my people? There's some who say my family won't even listen to me. My own blood would not listen to me. They, they're frustrated. You can't be frustrated. You cannot grieve over them. If they're gone, they're gone. If Allah has chosen you to see the truth, He has chosen you to see the truth. So the consul, and this is something that you will also find as part and parcel of a solution in the surah itself. The problem is highlighted, the issue that people would encounter. This is an issue that people will encounter. That within their own people, they will be parted. They will be separated. The Prophet ﷺ said in the end of times, there will be two camps. The camp of believers, the camp of hypocrites. They will be parted even within family. The solution is also in Surah Al-Kaf, which we will come to when we come to uh, Musa and Al-Khidr. So what is this thing that people are hung up on? The ultimate, ultimately, on an existential level, you see the world as truth and falsehood, as material and spiritual, as good and evil. And it's two part. So if you're not a spiritual person, then by logical deduction, you are a material person. There's no in between. If you are not a follower of Christ, then you are by logical deduction, a follower of the Antichrist. There is no in between. When I say Christ and Antichrist, I mean Nabi Isa and Ad-Dajjal. And the reason he's called Ad-Dajjal is because of, it's a, it's a title, it's not his name. Ad-Dajjal, Dajjala means to, to smear over, to cover over. So the smearing, the act of smearing, the, the Arabs used to smear the camel, their camels with tar um, to prevent illness. The smearing over is the covering up of what's true. Kafara or, or the, 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 one of the meanings of kafara is to cover up the truth. So a kafir is somebody who essentially has heard the true message has possibly understood or not understood, that's a relative matter, but has chosen to reject that message by covering up the truth with his own convoluted lies and conceptions. So Ad-Dajjal is somebody who is the cover-up of truth. He is the imposter, he is the liar, he is the deceiver. And how does he do that? If the truth is existential, if the truth is spiritual, if the truth is haqiqah, reality, how does he cover it up? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ja'alna ma'ala al-ardi zinatan laha li nabluwahum ayyuhum ahsanu amala. Indeed, we have placed on the, on the earth all that is on the earth. Ma'ala al-ardi, everything that's on the earth. Zinatan laha, as an adornment. Li nabluwahum ayyuhum ahsanu amala. To determine between them who is the best in action, which of their deeds are the best. Zina as an adornment is something that is an outward form that is, that is the, the, the beauty of the thing, right? It is the outward shape and form. If you, if you look inward into the thing, it doesn't seem as beautiful. The outward form is the beauty portion. That is the adornment. When he's saying everything on the earth as an adornment, he doesn't mean that he has placed things here and there as decorative pieces. No, it is the outward form that is an adornment. Um, one, of, one, of the, one, of, one of the most beautiful sayings I've heard in philosophy, Indeed, the world is, is meaning presented as forms, as images. Whosoever can understand that, whosoever can see that meaning beyond the form, uh, is somebody of ibar, of, of understanding, of discernment. Now, ibar, 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 um, i'tibar is like, it's building a bridge. I'tibar is crossing over. It's like a bridge. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, Inna fi dhalika la'ibratan li'uli al-absar. Indeed, in this, uh, in that, are the signs for a for a for uh, for a, for a people who can see, who have insight, who have basira. Fa'atabiru ya'uli al-absar. 
cross over, move over into the from this world into the next world. All you people who have insight, fa'atabiru. Don't get hung up. One of the sayings of Nabi Isa, Nabi Isa alayhi salam is uh, in Arabic, ad-dunya mu'biratun, the world is a bridge. Fa'abiruha wa la ta'amiruha. Cross over. Don't build on it. Don't build on the bridge. Cross over to the other side. And we said that Nabi Isa is the embodiment of spirituality. And that by logical deduction makes At-Tajjah the, embody the embodiment of materialism, the outward form, the jasad. The, the, so the zina is essentially a, an outward embellishment or a decoration or a beauty in that it is also an illusion. And the illusion is not a magic trick. It is an illusion meaning that the thing that it is, is not what it really is. It points to something else. So everything in the world of creation is an ayah. It is a sign and a sign never points to itself. It always points to someone else or something else. So in the inward form of the thing, it points to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The outward form has no meaning. It is the inward form, the essence of the thing that has meaning. So everything in the world, in the physical material creation of everything, it is an illusion or a delusion. Ibn Allah said it uh, very beautifully. He said, Al-Akwanu Zahiruha Izza Ghizza Ghirra Wa Batinuha Ibra Al-Akwanu Zahiruha Ghirra Wa Batinuha Ibra that the world is outwardly a delusion, but it inwardly reminds you through meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَالنَّفْسُ تَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ ظَاهِرِ غِرَّتِهَا The soul, that is the egoistic portion of the soul, the dimension that is of, of, the, of, the, of the self, the human being that is more animalistic, the egoistic portion is always fixed on the glitter, on the outward delusion, on the outward form of the thing. وَالْقَلْبُ يَنْذُرُ إِلَىٰ بَاطِنِ عِبْرَتِهَا But the heart penetrates into the inward, into the ibra, hence crossing over from the outward form into the, to the other side, so to speak, from the material to the spiritual. This is something that the human being has been, is the human being's, ability or, 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 his, or his special power, so to speak. The angels have their unique ability, the jinn have their own unique abilities, animals have their own unique abilities, but man has been given an amazing ability. And that ability is to abstract the essence of something from the outward object into an understanding of that something to remove the essence and bring it into his own self, into his own mind, and to be able to ponder and think about it. The, uh, the process of that abstraction, by asking what is it, this is called quiddity, from Latin quides, what is it? In Arabic we say mahia, and the resultant should take you to the jauhar. Jauhar is the essence of the thing, of the object. So what it is, and then you come to understanding what it really is. So what it is, it's a tree. What it is, it's a rock. What is it really? Why is it there? What is its purpose? Why was it created? That process ongoing is the process of seeking knowledge. And ultimately that process should take you to the person who created it, to the creator himself. That is the regression going backwards, the raja, the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in recognizing that he is the Rabb, when he asked, Allah to be Rabbikum, way back, and then you forgot about it. You now remember why you testified to it. Bala shahidna, we believe, we testify, you are the Rabb. So when you understand the world, the alam, you understand, you should, if you're on the right path, Siratul Mustaqim, if you're on the right path, you should be able to understand the Rabb. If you're not understanding who the Rabb is, whatever guide, whatever road, whatever career path, knowledge, study, whatever it is that you're pursuing, you should understand that it is the wrong path. The right path should lead you to understanding who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So when you can understand the Rabb, 
you can then allocate him due praise. Alhamdulillahi. Because when you praise someone, it has to be deserving. It has to mean something. It's not just open praise. You have to praise him so that you, by understanding and recognizing why he deserves that praise. And then understand why it is, why he deserves that praise as he who has created you and given you this ability to acquire knowledge so that you can know not just what he has created, but he himself as the creator. That is the ultimate path of spirituality. Spirituality is not just sitting and doing dhikr and turning off the lights and singing qasida and all that stuff. That is whatever it is, I don't know. Spirituality is bringing Allah into your presence. If he is not there and you have to do it, you have to bring that God consciousness in you. If he is not there, then it will be replaced with something else. And that something else is the zina. It is the adornment, the outward form, the material, right? Somebody once asked me, a friend of mine once asked me, how do I know that I'm being material, materialistic? I said, if you have to ask that question, you're already there, brother. Because you know, you are a spiritual being. If you are asking yourself, am I materialistic? You're already there. Because as a spiritual person, you have to be able to recognize what is material and what is spiritual. That recognition of a proper place of something in the world of creation, recognizing that this piece here is just for this world, this job, this career, this uh, recognition, this whatever it is, it's for this world. It's got no place in the afterlife. It's got no place in the akhirah. So whatever it is I'm going to try and accumulate here, it's not going to help me there. This recognition is the arrival of the soul to meaning. And then meaning arrives to the soul. And that is a person who now has knowledge. But that's only one half of it. The second half is the implementation of that knowledge. And that implementation is the amal. It is the deed. It is the action. It is living by those principles. It's one thing to read, to recognize, to understand, to know what it is, to know the procedures and the rules and the sharia and the fiqh, all that stuff. That's one thing. But to literally act on it, to live by it, to stand by those principles without any compromise, that is what is judged. That is what is calculated. And this is why he said, <laughs> To know which of them is the best in action because that's the ultimate place you're going to arrive at if you are a person of intelligence. Because that's what intelligence is going to lead you to, into recognizing your proper place as a human being in relation to yourself. What is your purpose in existence? Why do you exist? Why were you brought into existence in this time, in this era, in this family, in this part of the world? And what is your, what is your proper place in relation to everyone else, in relation to your, to your father, to your mother, to your husband, to your wife, to your children? to your community, to your ummah, to your prophet, and then ultimately recognizing your proper place in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you recognize these three dimensions, you are now on the right path. Because if you have recognized them correctly, then you will always implement the right. There is only one sirat which is mustaqim. There is only one. There is no other path to God. There is only one path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is intelligence. Intelligence is not books or academics or career or degree in PhD. That's not intelligence. True intelligence is recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is what you recognize the moment you were created. You recognize that. The path of return to him, the raja'a, is to recognize him as your Lord. The Prophet sallallahu said in Musnad of uh, Imam Ahmad, uh, donated by Ibn Mas'ud, Ad-dunya daru man la darun. The world is an abode, it's a dar, for one who does not have an abode. Wa mala man la mala lahu. And wealth for one who has no wealth. And what, what that means is that the world is, an, we as human beings, we don't have an abode. We don't have a home. 
our true abode is paradise or or the hellfire the abyss whichever whichever we decided to go for whichever we choose that's real estate for ourselves that's where you choose your house that's the market you either choose that or that whichever action you implement will decide where you go which is why he says makithina fihi abada in there they will abide the believers forever that's the true abode this is not an abode it's not the world it's not the place where you establish yourself it is just the bridge it's the ibar it is just the bridge that will take you to the other side right so and mala man la malahu and it is wealth for one who has no wealth because you arrive you have no place to stay you arrive into this world you have nothing to show for you have nothing that belongs to you there is no wealth for you but then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wala said wala wala ha yajma'u man la aqla lahu but the one who tries to accumulate all this tries to establish it here tries to gain all this wealth man la aqla lahu has no intelligence is not an intellectual person because true intelligence recognizes that you are just a traveler here you're just a journeyman through time you have to pass on you have to move over to the other side you have to cross the bridge because finally allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes on that portion inna wa inna la ja'iluna ma 'alayha sa'idan jurza and indeed we will make everything that is on this world will reduce it to barren soil or dust sa'idan jurza sa'idan is like soil and jurza is 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 barren nothing grows on it there are two ways to look at that particular portion that particular phrase one is that the world itself is made of matter right in physics we study the construction of everything that is matter is boiled down to the atomic level so everything is constituted of atoms and then further below below the atomic level the subatomic level is the quantum level so if you de- deconstruct everything in the world everything that is matter that is material you yourself included if you deconstruct everything all you will be left with is matter you'll be left with is uh, atoms or particles or dust that has no meaning has no form has no substance it's not a constituent of anything it doesn't do anything until it is actually put together the other meaning behind it is that barren soil sa'id and jurza is has got no intrinsic value it's got no meaning no purpose it is just barren empty and waste there's nothing to it so what he's trying to say is that this world has got no value has got no intrinsic value it might have monetary value it might have whatever value you want to give it in this world but it has no true value there's an old chinese saying that says uh, it's a is a shaolin saying um that uh, it's actually it's not a saying it was it was a conversation between master and student and the master asked the student which is more valuable a lump of gold or a lump of mud and the student said well a lump of gold i can what can you do with a lump of gold he said i can buy anything and everything i want i said yes a lump of gold is all glitter but the lump of mud is going to house the seed that will grow into a tree that will feed everyone else the mud has more value than the lump of gold because all that the gold can do is glitter and nothing more all that the matter and material can do is glitter that is the zina it is the world of materialism the one that has true intrinsic value is the one that can build the bridge to the other side that can move that can transcend that can cross over so this world is a temporary abode and that's what is being described here because the modern world comparatively going back even on a micro level to 2 to 3 generations back 
those who had the, the opportunity to sit with their grandparents and ask them about what kind of life they lived. See, history is all written about the wars and the politics and the nations and, the, and the, all that stuff. But true history is understanding how people actually lived in their homes, in their societies, in their families. How did, what kind of world or sense of worldview did they live by? And you will be able to see the difference between that generation and this generation, and you will be able to see the exponential paradigm shift. Like for, for myself, I did not see a computer until I was 19 years old. But my child saw a computer from the time he was born. He knows what it is. He knows what it can do. He's very curious about it. He will try and sit on it and try and push the buttons himself. And he is enticed, completely enticed by it. He does not see it as a tool, as an object of use for a purpose. He sees it as an allure. He sees it as a zena. And this generation is unfortunately going to be completely entrenched in modern technology. Completely entrenched. And that complete entrenchment is the creation of a jasad. Jasadan is a lifeless body. It's a hollow body. It has no essence in it. Inshallah, we'll come to that when we examine the link between Surah Al-Kahf and Nabi Sulaiman by looking through the history of the Israelites. I'm going to end there. Barakallah. Rabbana taqabal minna inna ka anta samiyun alim wa tuba alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawabu rahim bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Barakallahu feekum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.